When Space Shuttle Challenger launches on a January morning in 1986, a key engineer is sure a catastrophe is coming. We've got to stop the flight. We cannot let Challenger launch, period. This is insane. He thinks the ship is going to explode. And liftoff. Liftoff of the 25th Space Shuttle mission, and it has cleared the tower. 73 seconds later, disaster strikes. Seven astronauts die in front of their families and millions of television viewers. Our hearts were shattering, much like uh, those pieces that were falling from the sky. What really happened during that fateful flight? Was tragedy inevitable? Or could the shuttle and its crew have made it into space? Could they have made it? That question uh, haunts me. Disasters don't just happen. They're a chain of critical events. Unravel the clues and count down those final seconds from disaster. Roger Beaujolais knows the space shuttle hides a deadly flaw. I was so angry. Look at it! Damn it, look at it! I was literally screaming at them. But there's nothing he can do to stop the countdown. After I got home, first words my wife said to me were, what's wrong, honey? I said, oh, nothing, honey. It was a great day. They're going to launch tomorrow and kill the astronauts. But outside of that, it was a great day. North America, Florida. January 28th, 1986. 8.08 a.m. One and a half hours to lift off. At Kennedy Space Center, final preparations are underway for the most anticipated space mission since the glory days of the Apollo era. Thousands have descended to the Cape to watch Space Shuttle Challenger make history by sending the first citizen into space. School teacher, Krista McAuliffe. Krista never thought of herself as an astronaut. She felt that she was a teacher now. She felt this way, that she could show everyone how important teachers were and get children excited about education and wanting to do the very best that they could. She said it was the best field trip ever. 37-year-old oh, Krista, mother of Scott and Caroline, has spent five months training for space. In the process, she has become a national celebrity. She knows there's a lot riding on this mission. After two decades of budget cuts and a loss of public interest, the shuttle has never made good on its promise to provide a routine bus service to space. By sending Krista into orbit, NASA hoped to restore faith in their billion dollar baby. 8.38 a.m., one hour to lift off. Krista and the six other astronauts kit up and prepare to board the spacecraft. Pilot Mike Smith is making his launch debut. Specialists Ron McNair, Ellison Onizuka, and Judy Resnick have flown three missions between them. Satellite specialist Greg Jarvis is on his first trip. Thank you very much. And leading the mission is Commander Dick Scobie. As usual, it's a real pleasure to be at the Cape to come down here and participate in something that the Cape does better than anybody in the world, and that's launching space vehicles. To finally be the commander of a mission into space was a tremendous reward to him. He loved to dance the skies. Dick and June were childhood sweethearts, married for 14 years. This is the second time she is watching her husband set off for space. Good morning, Mike. We're ready today. 
Of the four spacecraft in the fleet, Challenger is by far the most reliable. In the two and a half years since its space debut, it has flown 40% of all shuttle missions, sending 51 astronauts into space on nine trouble-free flights. But this mission has not been going to plan. Bad weather has delayed launch for over a week. This morning, specialists sent up several weather balloons to check today's conditions. All the data looks good, but there's a problem. Unseasonably cold weather has covered the pad in sheets of ice seven and a half centimeters thick and icicles over a meter long. No shuttle has ever launched in such freezing conditions. Launch control decide to delay liftoff for two hours in the hope that most of the ice will melt. From their position in the stands, Krista's parents are worried. Just didn't feel right at all. And my husband said, he said, you know, if I could go and take her off that thing, I would. Good morning, Krista. Hope we go today. Good morning, Krista, too. With 30 minutes to go, air traffic control clears Eastern Airlines Flight 677 to fly over the Cape en route to Tampa, Florida. Suddenly, the plane hits a strong jet stream. The pilot descends to 9,000 meters, and the turbulence stops. He spots Challenger still on the launch pad and assumes the wind must be the reason for the delay. This is Mission Control Houston. It's T-minus nine-minute mark. Flight controllers are ready to support launch. Uh, Roger, welcome. With only nine minutes to lift off, launch control checks to make sure all of the shuttle's propulsion systems are functioning properly. Booster, go. Challenger's three main engines can burn nearly 4,000 liters of fuel a second, fed from the giant 46-meter tall external tank. But the two solid rocket boosters are the real powerhouses of the system. Their three million kilograms of thrust accelerate it to 28,000 kilometers per hour, the speed it needs to break free of Earth's gravity. All of Challenger's systems are functioning correctly. The decision is unanimous. Mission Control, this is Kennedy. We are a go for launch. T minus two minutes. With so much fuel in one place, the risks are clear to everyone. But in the history of American spaceflight, no astronaut has ever been killed at liftoff. A comforting fact for some. I suppose every once in a while you'd think about it, but you'd say, oh, and NASA can do no wrong. They'll... And like Krista said, you know, Mom, she said, that shuttle, they can shut that down the very last second if anything's wrong. Ten. Nine. Eight. Seven. Six. Five. Four, three, two, one. And lift off. Lift off of the 25th Space Shuttle mission. And it has cleared the tower. It was unbelievable. My son reached his arms around his sister and me, and we looked across uh, at all the other families with such joy. So we were tremendously excited. Roger, roll program. Roger, roll, Challenger. Almost immediately, the shuttle begins a maneuver to roll over, putting the spacecraft on the correct trajectory for orbit. Good roll, flight. Raj, good roll. Good roll program confirmed. Challenger now heading down range. Challenger is already traveling at nearly 1,600 kilometers per hour. As it climbs beyond the 10 kilometer mark, a severe crosswind suddenly slams into the shuttle.
over 3,000 kilometers away, engineer Roger Beaujolais is watching in horror. Challenger is on the verge of disaster. As Challenger rockets upwards, it's traveling nine times faster than a speeding bullet. 58 seconds into flight, it encounters a side wind, but a second later, the shaking stops. Now comes the most critical part of the ascent, a phase known as Max Q, where the aerodynamic forces are at their greatest. Travel too fast, and the shuttle will break apart. Mission Control, under the command of Flight Director Jay Green, order Challenger to throttle down her engines. 3 at 65. 65, Fido. PDL confirms throttle, thank you. At 66 seconds, Challenger gets the all clear. It has made it safely through Max Q and enters the thinner air of the upper atmosphere. Now it must accelerate to over 28,000 kilometers per hour to escape Earth's gravity. It's time to turn up the main engines to full power. Mission Control gives the cue. Challenger, go and throttle up. Challenger, go and throttle up. Challenger is engulfed in a massive fireball. Mission Control is stunned. They lose all contact with the spacecraft. Flight GC, we've had uh, negative contact, lost the downlink. Copy. Their data hasn't indicated that anything was wrong. Okay, all operators, watch your data carefully. Nobody is sure quite what has happened. Krista's parents can't believe their eyes. The shuttle was gone. And we all knew, everybody knew that was, something was wrong. Um, something horrible was wrong, but of course nobody knew what it was. Flight controllers here looking very carefully at the situation. Obviously a major malfunction. You know, you just hope against all odds that the orbiter was able to separate. As the spiraling debris falls to Earth and plunges into the Atlantic, it's becoming all too clear what has happened. Flight final. Go ahead. RSO reports vehicle exploded. Copy. We have a report from the flight dynamics officer that the vehicle has exploded. Flight director confirms that. We are uh, looking at uh, checking with the recovery forces to see uh, what can be done at this point. We were just so stricken that this had happened because I never expected anything to happen. It was unreal. Incredibly, as the wreckage emerges from the fireball, the crew compartment is still in one piece. Right on flight. Go ahead. Did the RSOs have an impact point? Stand by. At Mission Control, Jay Green gets the exact location where the wreckage hit the ocean. DOD LSO reports that all, all soft forces have been scrambled and they are on their way. A massive search and rescue operation is immediately set in motion. They're hoping that the astronauts may still be alive. Then, they spot a parachute lowering from the sky. But it's a false hope. The parachute is only attached to the nose of one of the boosters. It's just part of the debris that continues to rain down over the Atlantic. The crew compartment can no longer be seen. Having fallen over 19 kilometers, it must have hit the ocean at over 320 kilometers per hour. The crew didn't stand a chance. With little evidence to go on, 
NASA have an almost impossible task to work out exactly what took place. But with the recovery of the crew compartment, they should be able to piece together what happened to the astronauts after the massive blast. The crew's helmets give NASA their biggest lead. Each astronaut had an air supply attached to their helmet to be used in an emergency. In the wreckage, NASA find that three of them had been activated. It's a horrifying discovery. It means that at least three of the astronauts survived the explosion and could have been alive during the fall to Earth, a journey of over two and a half minutes. At the memorial service, President Reagan pays tribute to the brave crew. All the relatives of the astronauts are there, including June and her family. We were just barely able to put one step in front of the other. There was silence among all these family members. We were stunned. Um, you never can prepare for anything like this. I was just sad. I, was, I just felt the loss. I felt, um, I felt naturally that it never should have happened, and I couldn't do anything about it. Dick, Mike, Judy, Elle, Ron, Greg, and Krista, your families and your country mourn your passing. We bid you goodbye. We will never forget you. While America mourns, the pressure is on to find out exactly what caused the shuttle to explode. A presidential commission spent five months investigating the disaster and to discover that the right solid rocket booster malfunctioned. The booster is made up of four segments bolted together. Where they meet is called a field joint. The area is sealed by a pair of compressed rubber O-rings. At ignition, the rocket fires up in under one hundredth of a second and forces the booster's steel casing outwards. The O-rings must expand at a speed faster than a blink of an eye to stop the rocket fuel escaping out the joint. The commission found that due to the freezing temperatures, the O-rings in the right booster's lowermost field joint did not enlarge as they should have. Gases twice as hot as the inside of a blast furnace escaped with deadly results. And liftoff, liftoff from the 25th Space Shuttle mission. As the shuttle accelerated skywards past Max Q, a flame burnt away the support attaching the booster to the external tank. As the attachment broke free completely, the entire bottom section gave way. The nose of the booster crashed into the top of the tank with devastating results. But now, one man is convinced there's more to the story than the O-rings and the weather. After the investigation, a fairly simple conclusion was drawn in the public mind about what went wrong. Cold plus O-rings. Put them together and you have a Challenger explosion. Well, there was more to the story. Renowned author James Child has spent 20 years unraveling some of the world's worst technological disasters. He's investigated everything from the Chernobyl nuclear explosion to the Air France Concorde disaster. Charles believes that in the Challenger accident, compromised O-rings can't have been all that was to blame. One of the uh, thoughts had been that if an O-ring failed, everything would go to pieces right there on the launch pad. Well, that didn't happen. Instead, it broke up at 73 seconds. Certainly, a mystery is laid in front of us. Something else must have been going on beyond a simple O-ring failure. So why didn't Challenger blow up on the pad? What caused disaster to strike 73 seconds into flight? And could the crew have been saved? Now, by re-examining all the evidence, 
we will discover the critical chain of events that led to the loss of seven astronauts' lives. Charles knows the shuttle was most at risk in the first few seconds of flight. Somehow, it survived both ignition and liftoff. Solving this mystery should shed light on the most tantalizing possibility of all. Could Challenger have remained intact long enough to get the astronauts into space? Had the circumstances been a little bit different, how close did the shuttle and its crew come to surviving? That question uh, haunts me. Childs knows that every detail of Challenger's launch will be vital in unraveling the puzzle. He begins by re-examining the evidence that led the commission to their conclusion that the O-rings were to blame. The original investigation began by looking at the footage shot by more than 200 cameras as the mission got underway. In the first two seconds, the images reveal mysterious black smoke billowing out from behind the right booster near the external tank. Using the camera positions, the Commission tried to work out exactly where the smoke was coming from. Camera E60, positioned nearly 400 meters from the launch pad, had a direct line of sight to the right booster. But it only got a partial view of the smoke. Next, they looked at an alternative position almost 600 meters west, camera E63, in the hope that this had captured a better shot. But again, the source of the smoke was obscured. The precise location of the smoke was unclear, so the Commission compared the two shots and calculated its origin to be within a 1.3 meter section of the right rocket booster's surface, 13 meters up. Analysis of the footage also indicated the smoke was billowing upwards. This vital information, together with the black color of the smoke, showed that it was the O-rings that were burning. But Jim Childs is not convinced this is the whole truth. If the O-rings had been breached, and were leaking rocket fuel, the super-hot gases should have burned through the booster casing immediately, blowing the entire shuttle to pieces at liftoff. As Childs scrutinizes the official report, he realizes he's not the only one with unanswered questions. My name is Roger Beaujolais. Engineer Roger Beaujolais worked for Thiokol, the company that built the boosters for NASA. I swear to tell the truth. The whole he testified to the commission in 1986. He too realized that a more complex chain of events must have taken place. On the morning of the launch, they were expecting temperature. We had a leak in a joint. It would blow up right at ignition. And not only blow up the shuttle, kill the astronauts, but it would blow up all the launch pad facilities also. Beaujolais' evidence stunned the commission. He revealed that he knew that the cold weather would jeopardize the mission. His conviction was based on evidence from a previous launch. A year earlier, in 1985, Discovery lifted off on a cold January morning. The temperature was just 11 degrees Celsius, the coldest launch conditions prior to Challenger's liftoff. When Discovery's rocket boosters were recovered, Beaujolais found a major problem in one of the field joints. There was a large amount of soot and signs of scorching around the O-rings. Beaujolais believed the cold made the O-rings rigid and prevented them sealing. On further examination, he noticed how close discovery had come to catastrophe. The O-rings were less than a millimeter away from burning through completely. But as Childs reads the report, he realizes Beaujolais' testimony didn't stop there. We uh, scheduled a teleconference between he made a far more damning revelation. A full 13 hours before liftoff, Beaujolais had actually tried to stop the launch. This here, gentlemen, proves without a doubt that the O-rings will not seal the joint. Had he been listened to, 
the disaster may never have happened at all. Journalist Jim Childs is re-examining a critical aspect of the Challenger shuttle disaster. Why didn't the vehicle blow up at its most vulnerable point during liftoff, when all the evidence says it should have? As he reads the report, he finds out rocket engineer Roger Beaujolais predicted such a scenario at a teleconference held the night before launch. Taking part were Morton Thiokol's four senior managers, NASA managers at Kennedy Space Center, and in Tennessee, NASA's head of rocket boosters, Lawrence Malloy. I don't think that you fully appreciate the seriousness. The question was asked, are you guys concerned about launching in cold weather tomorrow? When I heard that, I almost went nuts. I recommend that we do not launch if the temperature is below 53 degrees Fahrenheit. When Beaujolais warned them that the freezing temperatures made it too dangerous to go ahead, Thiokol's managers immediately advised NASA not to launch. We recommend not launching. But NASA considered the data to be inconclusive. Why are you guys trying to come up with launch commit criteria on the eve of a launch? Those are powerful metaphorical statements that interpret for all of us, engineers and managers alike, to mean you're screwing up my launch schedule. In response to Malloy, Thiokol's managers put the teleconference on hold and reconsidered their position. And it's obvious that uh, our hands are tied. When it looked like they were changing their minds, Beaujolais made a last ditch attempt to convince them to abort. This, gentlemen, this is real data. He reminded them of the burnt O-rings from Discovery's near fatal flight a year earlier. Look at it! Damn it, look at it! I was literally screaming at them to look at the photos and not ignore what they were telling us. You have to be blind, deaf, and dumb not to know what these two pictures are telling you. The longer the delay in sailing the joint, the greater the risk of disaster. But this time, Beaujolais' evidence was ignored. General manager said in a soft voice, take off your engineering hat and put on your management hat. That is the strongest metaphor to play ball that I've ever heard in my 27-year engineering career in the aerospace industry. Okay, gentlemen, let's take a vote on it. Go for launch. All four managers agreed to launch. This is Viacall. Back online. What's your answer? It's a go to launch. When they told NASA, Lawrence Malloy immediately accepted their decision. I was so angry. I, I had to stay as composed as I could by kind of separating myself from what was going on in the meeting at that point, or else I would probably jumped up and punched somebody out. The next day, as Beaujolais watched the launch, he fully expected to witness a ground-level blast of gargantuan proportions. As the vehicle ignited and cleared the launch tower, a big sigh of relief came through me. We had just dodged a bullet because it hadn't exploded on the pad. But of course, Beaujolais' relief was short-lived. I sit in sun silence, and I can't tell you to this day, 20 years later, how long I sat there. I eventually found my way back to my office. I actually put my feet up on the desk and looked at the corner between two walls, and I fought for hours to hold back the tears because I was an emotional wreck. If even the one man who predicted disaster was surprised at what actually happened, then surely there's more to discover about how the seven astronauts were killed. Like the commission before him, Charles returns to the image of the black smoke leaking from the right solid rocket booster. After all, this was the key evidence that pointed to the O-rings being the cause. Are there any more clues to be had from this precious footage? One becomes immediately obvious. The smoke starts, then stops two seconds later. Why?
we know from the film, the smoke starts shortly after launch, it goes for about two seconds, it stops. We know that something has stopped it. We don't know what. And there is more. The smoke does not come out in one long plume. It comes out as a series of nine short puffs. What is causing this pulsing? The investigators knew that the booster was put under incredible stress at the point of ignition. So they examined this critical phase in more detail. To fire the booster, a flame is shot from the top downwards through a tunnel in the middle of the solid fuel. In less than a hundredth of a second, the rocket ignites. The explosive force causes the steel casing to expand outwards in one sharp movement. The gases burning inside are now under tremendous pressure and firing out of the exhaust at over eight and a half thousand kilometers per hour. But despite being under continuous strain, the field joint on Challenger's right booster somehow sealed itself and the smoke stopped. Childs examines how the investigators answered this thorny mystery. They looked further back at the takeoff sequence. Six seconds before liftoff, the main engines fire up. At this point, the whole shuttle is still bolted to the ground. The enormous thrust pushes Challenger's nose over by a meter. As it returns to vertical, the bolts fixing the shuttle to the pad release. And simultaneously, the boosters ignite. This rocking motion sends a shock wave throughout the entire vehicle. It's a phenomenon NASA engineers call the twang. As the vibration passes through the structure, is it possible that the resonance is opening and closing the seal inside the field joint? Is this what is causing the black smoke to billow out in puffs? If so, then the timing of the puffs should match exactly the twang's natural frequency of three times a second. From careful examination of the film, the smoke does indeed seem to billow out at the same rate. It's clear from the match between the frequency of the smoke puffs and the vibration of the solid rocket booster that the twang is directly responsible for these puffs of smoke. It's a major step forward. As the solid rocket booster flexed, it must have caused the field joint to open momentarily, producing the telltale puffs of smoke. But the second, more difficult question remains. If the O-rings were being breached, why did the smoke suddenly stop 2.6 seconds into liftoff? Most likely scenario is that something blocked the hole that really can be the only explanation. With the booster running at such intense temperature and pressure, only one thing could have blocked the hole, the rocket fuel itself. In the 50s, solid rocket fuel was revolutionized when a new element was added, aluminium. It raises the burning temperature and increases the thrust by about 50%. But aluminium-enhanced rocket fuel leaves a metallic residue known as slag, which is normally blown out of the exhaust along with the hot gases. After reading the detailed reports, Childs agrees the slag might be the key to the mystery. We'll never know the exact dynamics, but it fits the physics. The theory is that as the booster burned, aluminium slag built up around the gap left by the burning O-ring and stopped the hot gases leaking through the field joint. This mechanism would finally explain why the shuttle didn't blow up at liftoff. So given that the booster survived the most dangerous phase of any mission, the traumatic shakeup of launch, why did disaster strike 73 seconds into flight? The commission uncovered two important leads. At 58.8 seconds, a film camera captures a flame appearing on the side of the right booster. Moments later, 
there's an unexpected reading in Challenger's flight data. More than 2,000 transmitters spread all over the vehicle give mission control an accurate account of the spacecraft's behavior in real time. The information called telemetry is recorded on the ground. At 60 seconds, the pressure in the booster suddenly starts to fall from 44.7 kilograms per square centimeter to 43 kilograms per square centimeter. Something has gone wrong in the right-hand booster. It's 24 pounds per square inch low. A loss of pressure can mean only one thing. The hole has reappeared and rocket fuel is escaping at high speed. So Childs now has to find the reason why the hole opened. Immediately he notices what seems too much like a coincidence. At the very moment the flame appears, 58.8 seconds into the flight, Challenger passes through the danger zone known as Max Q. This is where the air resistance experienced by the shuttle is at its greatest and the structural forces peak. Given that Max Q occurred just as the flame appeared, Childs wonders if the stresses on the ship could have dislodged the slag. Why would it open again? It might well have to do with the stresses on the shuttle at around the 60-second point. That might well be enough to open it up and free those chunks of slag. It's a reasonable theory, but there's no proof. The shuttle was not overspeeding and had correctly throttled down to 65%, so it shouldn't have been unduly stressed. Engines at 65%, three engines uh, running normally, three good fuel cells, three good APUs. Perhaps something else was going on. Reading through a little-known report by an engineer who studied the accident on Morton Thiokol's behalf, Child stumbles on an intriguing possibility. He takes another look at the film of Challenger's ascent. Just as the report states, the trail of exhaust has a very unusual shape. The column of smoke displays a dramatic zigzag, then returns to vertical just moments before the astronauts were killed. Is this smoke trail evidence that the shuttle was hit by a strong side wind during its ascent? Initially, it's hard to make the theory stand up. In the hours leading up to liftoff, NASA's meteorologists sent up several weather balloons to check for strong crosswinds. Their data indicates there was nothing unusual. But Childs isn't convinced the weather balloons got it right. Closer examination reveals the balloons had drifted over 64 kilometers downwind during their ascent. It's unlikely they would have experienced the same weather conditions as Challenger. Further intriguing evidence comes from the telemetry that monitors the ship's direction. At 58 seconds into flight, Challenger's main engine nozzles suddenly alter their thrust angle by two degrees. The large adjustment is an automated reaction to keep the craft on track and suggests that some external force could have been pushing Challenger off course. What's more, the shuttle's lateral accelerometer, a device that measures sideways movement, throws up a surprising reading at exactly the same moment there's a sinister gap in the data. This could mean one of two things. Either there was a glitch in the telemetry, or the lateral acceleration was so violent that the reading went right off the scale. If the second of these two options is the truth, it could be the key as to why Challenger blew apart, taking with it the lives of seven astronauts. Jim Childs believes he's close to finding out the truth behind what may have caused the Challenger disaster. The telemetry indicates that the shuttle was knocked violently sideways at 58 seconds into the flight.
he returns to the image of Challenger's smoke trail. And sure enough, at 10 kilometers, the smoke trail has an extreme dogleg to it. The zigzag could be evidence of a fast-moving narrow layer of air, a jet stream, tracking rapidly east. Finally comes the last piece of the puzzle. The report states that just 30 minutes before liftoff, a commercial jet flew above the launch site. As it did so, the Boeing 757 was hit by a headwind of over 300 kilometers per hour. It's a shocking revelation. It looks like Challenger must have passed through the same layer of air as it climbed towards space. As it entered the jet stream, it would have been hit broadside with a force equivalent to Hurricane Katrina. Now, by rewinding the events of that ill-fated flight, and by following the evidence uncovered during the extensive investigation, we can finally reveal exactly what caused the Shuttle Challenger disaster 73 seconds after liftoff. Four, three... 73 seconds to disaster. One. The solid rocket boosters ignite. Inside the right booster, the O-rings have been hardened by the freezing temperatures and are unable to keep the lowermost field joint sealed. They start to burn away. And lift off. And lift off. As super hot gases escape, small pieces of aluminium slag from the rocket fuel build up and block the hole, preventing a catastrophe on the launch pad. 15 seconds to disaster. As Challenger enters a fast-moving yet very narrow jet stream, it is shaken violently. The aluminium slag is dislodged. Almost immediately, a flame appears on the right solid rocket booster. Eight seconds to disaster. With blowtorch intensity, the flame penetrates the external tank and liquid hydrogen starts to spill out. One second to disaster. The attachment between the booster and the tank breaks free and the entire bottom section of the tank gives way. The inferno thrusts the hydrogen compartment upwards into the oxygen-filled container, just as the nose of the booster crashes into the top of the external tank. Nearly two million liters of fuel combust instantaneously. The shuttle breaks apart. For Childs, it's a sobering end to his investigation. It could have all been so different. He is certain that had the wind not been so strong, the slag could have remained in place. The booster pressure would have remained normal and two minutes into flight, the rocket boosters would have disengaged and separated from the shuttle. Challenger and its crew would have then been safely on their way to space. Confirm good solid rocket booster separation. If the aluminium slag had only hung on for another 62 seconds, the astronauts might be alive today. My husband was very angry, very angry. In fact, he was so angry they were worried about him that he might have a heart attack. Uh, and he never really lost that anger. He blamed NASA. He uh, felt it never should have happened. And he had lost his daughter, his pride and joy. I never thought I was angry because I was just sad. I just felt the loss. But it had happened, and, and there wasn't any way of bringing her back or any of them back. In their final report, the president held the managers of both NASA and Morton Thiokol responsible for the decision to fly. In the months following the disaster, Morton Thiokol paid the astronauts' families around $4.6 million. 
but were awarded a $1.8 billion contract to develop a new range of rocket boosters. NASA's Lawrence Malloy was offered a promotion to Deputy Director of All Propulsion Systems. Roger Beaujolais resigned from Wharton Fire Coal and suffered a nervous breakdown. First two years after the disaster were a living hell. I did nothing wrong, and everybody has the responsibility to do what they get paid for, and that is to stand up for what they know is right and what their profession demands of them, and that's all I did, and I'd do it again. The shuttle program was grounded for three years while the spacecraft was redesigned and a broad range of safety systems put into place. But even so, in 2003, Columbia burned apart on its return journey from space. Seven more astronauts lost their lives. The investigation into the accident concluded that NASA had failed to learn many of the lessons of Challenger. To this day, the agency's hopes for routine space travel have never been realized, and no other private citizen has ever flown aboard a shuttle.